Well, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight in this uh, inaugural annual uh, Page and Dory P. Patterson Spring Lecture Series. I want to thank you for coming here tonight, and uh, I've got a few words of announcement, but why don't we open up tonight in prayer? Pray with me. Father, we love you and thank you for loving us. We thank you that uh, we can worship you freely. We thank you that we're in a place unlike uh, our Anabaptist forefathers, that we don't have to hide in the cave, uh, but we can actually publicize the fact that we're here uh, talking about you and talking about your word. God, we uh, most of all, though, thank you for the sacrifice of your son on the cross, uh, that we as sinners uh, could find redemption uh, for your son coming, living a perfect life, uh, dying and being raised again, and allowing us to be raised again to new life. As we go on tonight, may we honor you in all we do, may we grow, and most of all, may we worship you in spirit and truth and with our minds. Listen, Christ, let me pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Let me give you the, the layout of the evening. Uh, this is a, one of three evenings of lectures that we are dedicated this spring to Anabaptistica. Uh, next year, when we do these lecture series again, the topic is going to be creation. And every year after that, we will have a different topic, <clears throat> and we will bring speakers uh, to speak on those topics, and we will also have some of our faculty, as we have this year, uh, give lectures on the, the various topics. Uh, this year, um, a series uh, is uh, actually was uh, um, funded by a generous gift of one of our alumni. And uh, just so you know, uh, we actually have a matching fund for that. So if you want to help fund next year's series, uh, uh, talk to me sometime during the evening as we do that and encourage uh, our students to really think through uh, academic matters and matters of the faith. Uh, uh, Dr. Kaner is going to come up first. He's going to tell us why Anabaptism is important uh, to Truett and why we have a, an Anabaptist vision associated with Tru uh, what Truett does. Uh, then Dr. Paige Patterson will be our plenary speaker for the evening. Uh, at the end of his uh, uh, lecture, we will have a time of question and answers. Uh, so uh, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and run them down. And uh, he's always uh, pleased to entertain any question on the spot. Uh, then we'll have a short break, and then Dr. Michael Whitlock will present uh, another lecture, and then we'll have question and answers after that. Uh, again, thank you for coming, and I do hope that this evening uh, we'll glorify God and we'll help you grow in your walk with Christ. Well, I'm going to be the one that's short tonight, but I do want to present why this is such a key to us here at Trim Connolly University and has been such uh, for such a long time, for our 11 years that my wife and I have been here, certainly, uh, and then even beforehand in some other places. And I'll just give you a bit as you understand the background, uh, because I didn't grow up in the Christian faith whatsoever. And when I came to faith in Christ, there was some sacrifice that needed to be made in order for me to honor my Lord and to take a stand for Him. And as I was starting to grow in the faith, I was looking for those that could be an example to me. Now, most of us that look for those who are an example look for the living, um, and I certainly did so. In fact, perhaps only second to Dr. Patterson, my greatest mentor is an ex-moonshiner who got saved and led me to Christ, and that's the beautiful body of Christ of uh, how the Lord uh, works and uses. With that said, uh, I continually tried to emulate those that were around me until ultimately I was called to ministry. And ultimately, Lord got me out of Ohio. Uh, that is a good thing um, in so many ways. And I became a carpetbagger and moved south. Uh, ended up in this uh, mega university entitled the Criswell College. Uh, I went from the Ohio State University, where there were 60,000 people, to Criswell College, where I think we had at the time about 400 uh, students that were there. It was the best decision I've ever made in ministry. Um, and what happened is I'm roaming the hallways, and I had been discipled somewhat by my church, like many of our churches in here, just made do, as you can imagine, is I started to hear about this group that we are talking about tonight, uh, the Anabaptists. And all of a sudden, my greatest examples in faith as I was moving forward in ministry, not only were those who were living and pouring into me, but the inspirations were those who had gone on to be with the Lord, many of whom had done so in a sacrificial manner. The Anabaptist movement of the Reformation and the Anabaptist movement even previous to the Reformation was a movement that, so for example, if you were in the 16th century 
you accepted Christ as your Savior. You were baptized subsequent after your salvation. You were tagged a radical, an anarchist, an Anabaptist. And if you ever dared to become a leader, an evangelist, a pastor, an apologist, you were tagged on earth, and the average lifespan of a leader was 18 months before they were put to death. And they were put to death in various ways. The uh, ones that most known by those who know anything about our forefathers are they were put to death by drowning, like Felix Mons, or they were burned at the stake, like Balthasar Hubmeyer, the namesake for our missions and theology school. As you started to see the sacrifice they made, they recognized as well they were the mass Great Commission movement of the time. I graduated from Criswell College, but I was so latched to this group theologically and historically, that ultimately I finished up a PhD studying them, studying under a Cistercian Catholic Hungarian priest. And I fell in love with Balthasar Hubmeier, a certain um, man of the Reformation, and um, perhaps the most influential quote he has ever uh, given to me uh, through his written word was this. He quoted in Freedom of the Will Part Two, which was written now 491 years ago. God, by means of his sent word, gives power to all people to become his children and freely entrusts to them the choice to will and to do good. There was certainly an argument that was going on within the Reformation of whether man was able or unable to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who said that you were able also many times attached, as Catholics would do, a works to their salvation. Those who said you were unable attached to themselves a theology not in the sufficiency of Scripture, but in the sufficiency of being in the secret will of God through election that you could not know. And I didn't like either of those answers. And I watched as in seminary, and then in my PhD, seminarians fight a ridiculous argument. Are you a Calvinist or are you a Minion? And to me, the, that is one of those absurd questions you can ask, as if there's only two points of view between two Presbyterians who fought over it 400 years ago. And I thought, you know, that doesn't represent me at all. And then all of a sudden I came across that quote to which Hubmeyer said, you're not able by your natural good, and you're not unable because of your evil in your life. You are only able because God wrote his word so you can understand it and revealed his will to you. That changes everything. It changes the way you preach. Because when you preach that way, you're not going to get up, preach the word, and then just sit down and say whatever mystically God wants to do. Instead, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 comes to surmise your preaching. And in the end, you will say, as Jesus did, come, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You don't have to pray any longer if God wants you, if God is speaking to you. If God is moving in your spirit today, you don't have to preach any of that because Hubmeyer made it very clear that so impacted my life as a pastor and now as an educator. When you open God's word, he's there. And his spirit is inseparable from his written word, which means the only thing you can do, as you heard from chapel this morning, is open his word and speak it. And I'll promise you, according to God's word in Isaiah 55, it will speak to you. Because it doesn't matter how wretched or how wicked or how sinful we are, God's word is more powerful than our own human volition, and he speaks. So it changed everything in my thinking. Ultimately, the man who is about to present to you took a chance on a guy that probably didn't deserve a chance. And all of a sudden, I was teaching at Southeastern Seminary in 1999, now 20 years ago, and one of my subjects, wouldn't you know it, was on Anabaptistica. Six years later, he did something even was more ignorant. He hired me at Southwestern to begin a college that wasn't there. And he put on a tag to me the director of free church studies. And I didn't do that strong of a job there creating it there. Because three years later, God called me to be a Turkish redneck in the mountains of North Georgia. And I couldn't have been happier with the call. So what I wanted to do was just to give to our students an inspiration of the past. And you say, well, why? What, what's the whole point? I just want to leave you with three words that I think I hope all of our students walk away with as they hear this over and over again, whether it is in our Great Commission minor, and they're being taught by Dr. Whitlock in theology, 
whether they're doing church history and ministry with Dr. Graffinino and myself, whether they're walking through the Student Wellness Center and see George Blaurock and go, why do we have this guy up there? Shouldn't we have the man who paid the most money to get that thing built? No. We should honor our buildings not by those who give the most money, but those who give the most sacrifice. And that type of campus changes it. And so there are really three words I want to leave you with tonight that really represent these Anabaptists. Number one, forgotten. I'm an historian by trade, and I want you to hear this, and I've written it down so you get it the way I wish you hear it. History is written uh, by political winners, but eternity is forged by history's forgotten. You're going to read a lot about people. Remember, whoever wins the war writes the history. Whoever wins the politic writes the history. The Anabaptists are the forgotten. And to be honest with you, like Zinzendorf, a missionary, once said, my only job in life is to live, share Jesus, and be forgotten. And if they do that, then I've succeeded. Not just the forgotten, so that you would know that, but the faithful. For our children, one of whom is here tonight with me, Philippians 3.10 is the verse we've been praying over our children for nearly 20 years now, that they may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. You cannot live a Christian life without suffering. It's not possible. Now, the suffering may not look like that which of the underground church of China or the underground church in North Korea or the believers that are in more than 50-plus Muslim countries, but if you are not dying daily, you are not living for Christ. So these were the faithful. These were the ones that when you study the martyrs of the Anabaptists, it was astounding the wickedness poured over these people, and yet they lived a life of joy. Some were farmers, and they were required to jump off of barns onto pitchforks to their death just for the amusement of the people in the neighborhoods. Others were put to death in secret, as our own Dr. Dassault has demonstrated through his dissertation. A lot of the Anabaptists were executed in public. The ones that are executed in secret, we didn't know. In fact, stunning as it may sound, the names are still unknown to us today as we do an Anabaptist tour. And one last thing, not just uh, forgotten and faithful, but I want you to keep the word free in mind. Free is not merely free, but you are free to believe or reject Jesus. Secondly, you are free in terms of a free church. Don't attach any politic to the churches that are yours. I don't care if it comes from a Republican or a Democrat. I don't care if they promise you a billion dollars. The worst thing the church of our Lord Jesus Christ can do is attach a government to the church. What that will do is cause the people of Christ to stop living for Christ quicker than any sin you could imagine. Free. Imagine this. Imagine if you were an Anabaptist in 1525. The first martyr we know of in May of 1525 was a man by the name of Eberly Bolt. He is so unknown that we don't know if his name is Eberly Bolt or Bolt Eberly. Uh, the only way people would know him is we have a scholarship at Truett that has about a quarter million dollars in it named after him that we're building right now. But imagine why you're dying. You're dying to share the gospel, and you're dying to pray the same prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed in Acts chapter 26. I wish that you would altogether and always be like I am. That is, he's calling anyone who hears him the faith in Christ. That's a volitional statement. But secondly, he says, except for these chains. We would hope that the entire world would be free. I get that. And in my family, which my wife raised under communism and I raised under Islam, we appreciate freedom every July 4th. It is a stunning thing that any American wouldn't appreciate and show gratitude for living in a country that is so free that you can speak and live like you wish, especially considering the history of the world that so few people have ever gotten this right in history. But those people who died had to wait 200 plus years that a country would believe in the biblical principle of Matthew 13 of religious liberty and show it these United States and the French Revolution, and on the list goes as the West is influenced, there would not be a United States of America if there weren't first Anabaptists dying for the faith in the 16th century. 
That is part and portion why here at Troop McConnell University, all nine schools are named after an Anabaptist hero, six of whom are martyrs. That is why the Student Wellness Center is named after a martyr that was burned at the stake on September the 6th, 1529. And that is why as we move forward, as we do lectures, as you hear it in class, and why we have an Anabaptist class that's required, that's the reason why. Because I hope you will follow the emulation, the example of those who lived faithfully and freely, uh, even though they were put to death, so that in the end, those may hear Jesus Christ and eternity will be forged by your sacrifice. With that said, uh, I want you to hear from the plenary speaker. He is a hero of mine. He's the one who influenced me just more than anybody else. If you wonder what sermon it was that he preached that so hit me between the eyes, it wasn't. His life's a sermon. Uh, and in that way, it was a beautiful picture to someone who was so young. Uh, when I moved, I was just barely in my 20s. I had all of my hair in a sweet feathered haircut of the 1980s, even though it was the 1990s. And I was such a young and uh, inexperienced preacher. And in most universities, you don't get to see the president. In our universities, he taught. Not only would he teach, but then all the professors would say, hey, you come out and share Jesus with me. And I learned and got my chops off of that picture of a man who's walked with God now for so many decades. Dr. Patterson, would you come and pour into our students? That very probably is the finest introduction I have ever heard in my life. And uh, I wish that every Southern Baptist at Southern Baptist Convention had to listen to that, or not had to listen to it. They would be blessed by it. Thank you so very much. What I could tell you, though, about uh, Dr. Kanner is you should have seen him in those days. Uh, in fact, um, I can say that about uh, a number of your professors. I knew them when they were very young and uh, where uh, it was uh, interesting to see how they thought about things. And so it has been a great joy to me to be here and to see what they are doing and what they have achieved, and God is blessing them. Now, my assignment is to lecture on Anabaptistica and uh, what you need to know is that um, I'm not going to start with Anabaptists. Uh, and uh, the reason I'm not is because the story really doesn't begin there. After I get through, then uh, we're going to have a careful look at Dr. Balthazar Hubmayer. Uh, I think it's a remarkable situation when the president names his dog after a great theologian who died at the stake, uh, but somehow knowing Balthazar Hubmayer as I do, I think he would be thrilled to have the dog named after him, so I believe you're going to get by with it all right. Uh, what I want to do in this first lecture uh, is to disabuse you of one of the most popular myths that is present in our world. It is the myth of the monolithic church and the failure to understand that evangelicalism, as we understand it, was always present. Now, this is not a, um, um, a, a uh, exercise in the fact that everybody was a Baptist. Uh, some of my uh, friends have written books that would say that all of these people who were evangelicals in the past were actually Baptists. I don't believe that. They weren't all Baptist, but they were all evangelical. And uh, so to see the impact of them on the world and to us to understand that the world did not have one monolithic church prior to the Reformation. You would ask the average person on the street out there, what do you see as uh, church history is concerned? They would say, well, there was a Roman Catholic church that existed from the time of Christ under the Reformation, and then the Protestant church was born. And that would be their viewpoint and perspective. I hope to be able to show you that that is not really the case. So let's take a look, first of all, at what the Anabaptists said. In the year 313, Constantine issued the Edict of Milan. Uh, 
The Edict of Milan turned out to be the worst thing that could ever have happened to the Church of the Living God. In the Edict of Milan, this man Constantine, who was the Roman emperor at the time, said, until now, all Christianity has been religio illicita, that is, an illicit expression of religion. But from now on, Christianity is going to be religio licita, that is, a licit expression of Christianity. Well, uh, the situation that existed in the world at that time was rather obvious. There was a monumental failure of Greek philosophy, and uh, the philosophers had debated smaller and smaller questions that impinged less and less on the lives of people, and so people had gotten enough of it. The ancient religions of Greece and Rome had proven that they were false, and they had continual change involved in them, and so nobody took that seriously. Folks were looking for something in which they could put their faith. Along comes Constantine, and he says, from now on, Christianity will be an acceptable expression of one's faith. That monumental change which took place seems to be a wonderful thing, because up till then, Christians were persecuted exactly like they continue to be in many ways, even thereafter. People like Polycarp, for example, the pastor at the church at Smyrna, uh, gave his life and was burned at the stake as probably a centenarian. He was probably 100 years of age when he was burned at the stake, and so Uh, They had given their lives. Now along comes the Roman emperor, and he says, it's really all right to be a Christian. What resulted was a widespread, quote, turn to Christianity, end of quote. Huge armies were actually brought into the faith, baptized by sprinkling uh, with uh, various methods of baptism, but they were all baptized, even though oftentimes they had not the foggiest notion what Christianity was all about. So what happened is the churches were filled with unbelievers. The state became more and more involved in religion. And you heard what uh, Dr. Kaner said just a moment ago when he mentioned that that spelled the loss of freedom because as the state became the progenitor of all religious faith and the watchdog of all religious faith, then that became the era of people who didn't even know the Lord making decisions for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it was a tragic thing that happened. However, it was not the case that up until then, everybody had been together. In your Christology classes here, you have doubtless uh, encountered the movement that led to the first four ecumenical councils. The first one in Nicaea in 325, and uh, these were councils that were brought together by various groups in the church to attempt to determine who is Jesus the Christ. There was no doubt about the fact that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was exercising tremendous impact on many people's lives, but who exactly is he anyway? And so you had situations like Arius from Alexandria who said, well, Jesus was uh, a created being. Uh, There was a time when Jesus was not. And so because of the fact that he had quite a following, there was a major meeting held in Nicaea, at which time a vote was taken, and the majority of those present said, no, there was never a time when Jesus was not. The Word of God always existed. He is, it doesn't matter what the two guys riding bicycles and wearing black suits say, who come to your door, the fact of the matter is, There was never a time when the Lagos of God did not exist. There was a time when he had not taken upon himself flesh. There was a time when his incarnation in Bethlehem uh, 
uh, took place, but he always existed, and you have appearances of him in the Old Testament. Abraham, one day at the Oaks of Mamre, uh, was uh, sitting there when he was approached by three people. Two of them he eventually identified as angels. Now, it's interesting, as far as we know, they didn't have any wings at all. At least if they did, they had them tucked in their tuxedos. And uh, so they apparently didn't have any wings at all because angels are spirits, and they may appear in any one of several forms with no wings, with two wings, with four, or with six. And so these appeared without any wings at all. And as Abraham talked with them, one of them really stood out, and he later identifies him as the angel of the Lord. And what he says about him is very clear that he understood him to be God himself. So Jesus makes appearances in the Old Testament, but not yet the incarnate Son of God, which happens later. So you had all this discussion going on in the early church, and it happened not only with the Council of Nicaea, but with the Second Constantinopolitan Conference, with the Council at Ephesus, and finally with the uh, Council at Chalcedon, which occurred in 451, where they kind of nailed everything down to the best of their ability. But the thing to notice is that there was not agreement. None of these ventured an agreement. Every one of them had large numbers of people who disagreed with what they were saying. Well, not only did they not have a monolithic church in that regard, but uh, it is also true that following Constantine, things developed in such a way that uh, evangelicals soon clearly identified themselves as different from the main line. Um, some months ago, uh, we had the privilege of uh, being taken to the country of France with no less than uh, your professor here, and uh, Dr. Dussault had the responsibility of driving us around France to see some of the various sites of the Valdensees and others that we wanted to see. One day we said, we want to go to Lyon. And he said, that's easy. Lyon is a large industrial city in southern France and well known from the work of Peter Waldo. It'll be no problem, whatever. It is. No. We don't want to go to that Lyon. We want to go to Lyon, that is the little village in the Pyrenees Mountains. And uh, so Dr. Dussault said, okay, I'll see if I can find it. And it wasn't easy, but he kept on and he said, I think I found it. And we drove to this little village of, that was called in the days of the church fathers, Lyon in the Pyrenees Mountains between Spain and France. Well, we got there. We still weren't absolutely sure we had the place, but we got into their public library and talked to some people and so forth, and they said, oh, yes, this is the ancient Leon. This is the place. You found it. And so we were there, and the reason that I wanted to go there is that in Leon in the 4th century, in the 5th century, was a man by the name of Vigilantius. I don't want you to ever forget Vigilantius. Vigilantius lived in Lyon. He was born there. His father was involved with the Roman army. That is on the frontier. It's out there in the wild west of, the, of Europe at that time. And so his father had a roadhouse out there that he operated for the Roman government. And so Vigilantius was born out there. And before too long, he came to know the Lord as his Savior. And there is pretty good evidence that his father had come from the area of the Piedmont in France, in, uh, in um, Italy. Now, when you go to Italy, to uh, Turin, where the famous shroud is supposedly there, go on in internally a little bit further, and you get really into the mountains. And what we learned is that during all this time, when Everything went toward Roman Catholicism. 
there was a strong missionary movement in the Piedmont that refused to go along with the Catholic Church. They remained evangelical in all their ways. Well, that was Vigilantes. He had a heart of an evangelist. He wanted to reach people for Christ, but he was also a typical preacher uh, in that all preachers are expected to go to the Holy Land sooner or later. And he wanted to go to the Holy Land. He wanted to see for himself where Jesus walked. So Vigilantes took a trip to Jerusalem. He was absolutely mortified at what he saw in Jerusalem. Why the people, the very people that claimed to be the leaders of the faith were immersed in such debauchery and such evil that any similarity they had to Christianity was purely a matter of vocabulary and nothing more. And Vigilantia said, I just can't stand anymore. I got to get out of here. So he said, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go seven miles south to Bethlehem. I know Jerome is in Bethlehem, and I'll go down there, and I'll talk to Jerome, and I'll find the real gospel of Jesus Christ. So he left, went seven miles to the south to the Church of the Nativity. You can still go there today. In fact, they'll take you down, and they'll show you the exact spot where Jesus was born. And if you buy into that, well, then I've got some swamp land off the coast of Texas I want to show, sell you also. Uh, there's obviously no truth in it. We don't know exactly where Jesus was born, but the Church of the Nativity has the place there. And one thing we do know about it is that Jerome had an apartment there. We're talking about 404 B.C., 404 B.C. And so he has an apartment there. He's doing something that is actually very valuable. Jerome is translating the Latin Vulgate. And so he's down there working away, and, uh, and uh, Vigilantia shows up to meet him. At first, everything is wonderful. And Vigilantia is very proud of this uh, work that he's doing. But the more time he spends with him, the more he sees that Jerome has a profession of faith, but not the actions of faith. And so he begins to object to it. Eventually, he leaves there, goes back to Lyon in France, and he worked until his death there in Lyon for the evangelical faith. Now, I mention this to you because I'm not just talking about something that just uh, blew up. I am talking about uh, a situation that we have from the writings of Jerome. And so let me just share with you briefly, if I may, from the writings of Jerome. Uh, unfortunately, we have lost whatever it was Vigilantius wrote to him, but we can reconstruct it somewhat. Remember 404 BC, 404 AD, I said BC, I meant AD, 404 AD. And so you're not that long after the time of Christ, but uh, Vigilantius was writing to Jerome. Jerome writes him back. You can read this in the uh, Nicene, Anti-Nicene Fathers. Here's what he said. Pray call to mind the day when I preached the resurrection on the reality of the risen body, when you jumped up beside me, clapped your hands, stamped your feet, and applauded my orthodoxy. Now, however, you have taken to, to the sea, traveling uh, the stench of the high of the high of the bilge water has affected your head, and you have called me to mind only as a heretic. Well, my goodness, what in the word did Vigilance just say about him that made us think he was a heretic? Well, again, he says, the quote, the old Greek proverb is quite true. A liar is of no use to an ass. For my part, I can imagine that even your name was given to you out of contrariety, uh, for your whole mind slumbers, and, and actually more. So profound is your sleep, or rather lethargy, in which you have plunged. In fact, among your other blasphemies, which with sacrilege, uh, sacrilegious lips you have, uh, have uh, uttered, you have dared to say that the mountain in Daniel out of which uh, the stone was cut without hands is the devil, and that the stone is Christ, uh, who having taken a body from Adam, whose sins had before um, 
uh, connected him with the devil, is born to a virgin uh, to separate mankind from the mountain, and that is your and that is from the devil. Your tongue deserves to be cut out and torn into fragments. End of quote. Now Jerome was not the good guy that you've grown up to think of him as being. I strongly recommend the biography of Jerome, written by J.N.D. Kelly, as a, a priceless example of uh, a biography written by a liberal theologian who nevertheless tells the truth about Jerome, and you see it in the pages of that book, and I highly recommend that you read it. So Vigilantius was uh, characteristic of those who came along in those early centuries who were thoroughgoing evangelicals, rejected Catholicism, and appealed to the truth of God's word. In many other groups, the Montanists grew up. I would not be a Montanist today under any circumstances, but the Montanists grew up, and they, um, following uh, Tertullian, uh, among others, uh, believed in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Well, so do I but they believe that there was a continuing revelation that the Holy Spirit would give. And uh, so they taught that, and Montanism became widespread and represented a divergence from Roman Catholicism. Now, I'm not going to, to overwork this, but let me just say that you can take time uh, to look at the Novatians, the Donatists, uh, the Jovinians, the Paulicians, and a host of others, and find people who rejected Catholicism. Let's just take the Paulicians for a moment. The Paulicians rejected the apostate church. They uh, were adoptionistic in their Christology, so they were wrong there. They rejected all infant baptism. They rejected consubstantiation and transubstantiation, which was only beginning to develop at that time. They uh, insisted that uh, ministerial selection uh, be accompanied by great care so that no one went into the ministry who was not well prepared for it. They despised idols and consecrated objects and places. And so in many ways, they were very much like Baptists today. Some ways not, but in most ways they were. They were thoroughgoing evangelical. So we could go on and spend a lot of time with that. I don't want to do that. I simply want to press the point with you that from the beginning, there was not a monolithic church. It is simply not true. Forever, there were protesting groups who protested many of the same things that we protest today. Well, what about other evangelical groups that came along? I want to talk about uh, some of those for a few moments. Today, I mentioned in chapel that wonderful piece of statuary in Worms with Luther at the center, and on each of the four sides, the four precursors of the Reformation, because the Reformation didn't really begin with the nailing of the 95 Theses to the chapel church door at Wittenberg. That's a very convenient moment to focus on, and I have no objection to it, as long as you realize and recognize that the Reformation was much older than that. It had already begun. So let's take Peter Waldo, for example, if we may take uh, an example for a moment. Uh, Peter Waldo uh, was um, uh, a remarkable individual who evidently was born in the Piedmont. Mm, that we've mentioned that before, haven't we? Came out of the evangelical situation that existed in the Piedmont in Italy. By the way, a lot of those people came to this country eventually, migrated here. So you have the Piedmont in North Carolina, and you have a number of cities that are named with Waldensian names right there, in North Carolina. Well, anyway, uh, he was born in the Piedmont, but he didn't like the faith of mom and dad and grandpa and grandma. He, it, it seemed too restrictive to him. He was not a farmer, and they were all farmers, and, and that just didn't appeal to him at all. Uh, Peter Valdo only had one thing in mind, and that was 
He wanted to make money. Sound like a modern, doesn't he? Well, he wanted to make money. And so he left the Piedmont, and he goes to the modern city of Lyon in southern France, the industrial city, and there he began to do exactly what he planned to do. He made a mint of money. And first thing you know, he was not only wealthy, but it accumulated all around him a number of wealthy friends. And he was enjoying himself and life. And one night he threw a big banquet. And in the middle of the banquet, his best friend sitting right next to him at the banquet had a coronary rest and keeled over in his plate dead. Peter was a little bit shaken. He thought, maybe mom and dad knew something that I needed to get. Maybe grandpa and grandma had a faith that may have been important, and he began to struggle to understand the faith that he had abandoned. In the process of it, he hired a couple of priests who knew a little bit of language, language, and he hired them to translate the Bible into the language that he then was speaking primarily. And so they translated the Bible, and he began to read it, was deeply convicted, and Peter Valdo had a profession of faith. Well, he began to share this with all of his wealthy friends, and person after person after person in Lyon came to know Christ as Savior. And as a result, he began to meet with them and say, we can't keep this to ourselves. We must tell this everywhere. And so Peter Valdo led a movement that became known as the Valdensians. And uh, these people uh, literally were called the poor men of Lyon at that time. That's their name for themselves. They called themselves the poor men of Lyon. They were all wealthy. But they called themselves the poor men of Lyon because they sold everything they had, gave it to the poor, and used whatever proceeds they had left in order to fuel their evangelistic work throughout the world. Uh, we're talking about Peter Valdo, who died in 1215. We're talking about 200 years prior to the Reformation. And we have a major evangelistic evangelical movement going on with Peter Valdo. Remarkable what's going on. And they literally turned Europe upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want you to be aware of the Valdensians. We could do the same thing with John Hus uh, in uh, uh, your wife's country, uh, living in Prague. Um, you could do the same thing with uh, any number of them. Even one of the precursors for the Reformation was a, a, a monk who appears on the statue there in Worms in his monk's habit and his long nose. And uh, Jerome Savonarola is right there. Savonarola lived in Italy, and uh, there he began to preach from the book of Revelation. Oh, my goodness, don't do that. If you begin to preach from the book of Revelation, people get excited. And uh, so they got excited in Italy. And uh, hundreds of them would come every week to hear Savonarola preach from the book of uh, the Apocalypse. And so he preached the Apocalypse until they finally couldn't stand it anymore, and so they burned him at the stake. Now, all this is before Luther. That's what I want you to get. All of this is prior to Luther, the evangelical movement prior to Luther. Let me take just a moment more, if I may, and mention one more. I may have to get uh, uh, Dr. Kaner to help me with his name here. I never can say it right, um, because this man was also in Bohemia. His name was Peter Hel Chixie. Is that, that's right, basically? Say it for us. Yeah, that's it, okay? Uh, it's a very peculiar spelling. He was born about 1385. Um, he is the spiritual father of the Bohemian Brethren. 
uh, his doctrine was that Scripture is the only source for authority in faith and practice. Now, again, you're before the Reformation, and yet he is saying already that there is no authority for believing anything outside of the Scripture. Um, he believed that, uh, um, that uh, the state was a necessary evil, a necessary evil. It was ordained of God, to be sure, but it was a necessary evil, and invariably the state would be a problem, and he believed that with all of his heart. He rejected oaths. Uh, he rejected warfare of any kind. He was a missionary, uh, and he rejected the magistracy uh, of uh, Christian serving in the magistracy. Uh, magistracy. Uh, he um, um, was uh, determined that he would experience the imitation of Christ in every way. He preached the atonement uh, the, that uh, Christ died for our sins, for every man's sins, and he preached it openly. Salvation was by grace through faith alone. He did accept infant baptism, but reluctantly so, and that's the only place where I found any difference at all. He rejected transubstantiation completely. And so here was a man who is the founder of the Bohemian Brethren who in every way exhibited the evangelical faith. Now, what I've tried to show you here is not only is there a myth of a monolithic church, but in addition to that, there is strong evangelicalism present in the ancient world everywhere. And uh, we're now beginning to learn just how broad this was because when I get to the Anabaptist tomorrow and when you start hearing about Balthazar Hubmayer tonight in just a moment, you're going to hear and understand that these Anabaptists were built on a previous foundation also. And so there is a foundation that goes all the way back to the fathers and to uh, the church leaders in the first century. Now, I don't want you to go out of here and say, Patterson identified all these people as Baptists. He did not. I didn't make that mistake like some of our forefathers have. But what I have shown beyond any shadow of a doubt, just briefly and cursorily, is to show you that there were evangelical Christians in every age who were opening their Bible and reading it. Now, you know what? We should have known that. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What he promised there was that the church, though suffering and though paying a horrible price for it, would be faithful in every age, and God would raise them up to tell the story of Christ to a subsequent generation. And so, hopefully, you will not make that mistake that is commonly made, that there is a monolithic Roman Catholic Church prior to the Reformation, or that we didn't have evangelicals in every age. Well, let me pause there and see if you have questions you want to ask uh, before we get to the subject of Balthazar Hubmayer. Yes. Uh, the biography of Jerome is written by J.N.D. Kelly. He has three, uh, three initials there, J.N.D. Kelly, a noted liberal theologian, but a very honest one. Um, there are two kinds of liberal theologians. They are honest and dishonest, and he's one of the honest ones. He wrote you the truth, okay? It's an excellent book. All right? Mm -hmm. I think in many ways, the Hussites and uh, the Bohemian Brethren were, were very close to us, and, uh, and many of the Valdensees were also. Uh, there is, uh, I think, one of the best ways to get a, a handle on the Valdensees, incidentally, is, um, uh, if I can find it real quick here, um, yeah, here it is. Um, this is a, a poem uh, 
written by John Greenleaf Whittier. I love it. It is fabulous. And it, it gives you the story of, uh, the, of, of how these uh, uh, Valdensians worked. Uh, they became uh, merchants selling uh, uh, things like uh, uh, pearls and, and gems and so forth to, to women of high estate because they moved easily in that group. That's who they were. And so um, Greenleaf Whittier wrote this poem called The Vaudois Teacher. And that's the French name, Vaudois. The Vaudois Teacher. And uh, the poem is a beautiful poem that for some reason is hardly ever noticed. But let me just read it to you real quick because uh, it pictures a uh, Valdensian salesman uh, called a drummer in those days because he was drumming up business, you know. So the Valdensian drummer. So he says, he's talking with the lady, and he says, Oh, lady fair, these silks of mine are beautiful and rare. The richest web of the Indian loom, which, which beauty's queen might wear. And my pearls are pure as your own fair neck, with whose brilliant, with whose radiant beauty they vie. I have brought them with me a weary way. Will my gentle lady buy? And the lady smiled on the worn old man through the dark and clustering curls which veiled her uh, brow as she bent to view his silks and glittering pearls. And she placed their price in the old man's hand and lightly turned away. But she paused at the wanderer's earnest call. My gentle lady, stay. O oh, lady fair, I have yet a gem which a purer luster flings than the diamond flash of the jeweled brow on the lofty brow of kings. A wonderful pearl of exceeding price whose virtue shall not decay, whose light shall be a spell to you and a blessing on the way. And the lady glanced at the mirroring steel where her form of beauty was seen and where her eyes shone clear and her dark locks waved their clasping pearls between, bring forth thy pearl of exceeding worth, thou traveler old and gray, and name your price of your precious gem, and my page will count your gold. Cloud went away from the pilgrim's <laughs> brow as a small, meager book he took, unchased with gold or gem of cost, from his folding robe he took. Here, lady fair, is the pearl of price. May it prove as such to thee. Nay, keep your gold. I ask it not, for the word of God is free. That's your typical vaudois drummer uh, out there selling pearls and silk, but actually giving the word of God. And uh, Whittier caught the gist of it. Okay, any other question? All right, we are ready to consider the most remarkable of all of the Anabaptists, in my estimation, uh, Balthazar Hubmayer, uh, the only one who had a doctorate and who had richly prepared himself. And so we are ready for you, sir. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, for most of you, uh, needs no introduction. Uh, he has tortured you, uh, or will torture you in the future, and takes great pleasure in doing so. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> takes great pleasure in doing so, uh, but uh, really, uh, when it comes to uh, being a scholar here on campus, we appreciate his scholarship uh, and his desire for you all to learn the Word of God. So, uh, Dr. Whitlock, why don't you come up and, and uh, talk to us about Balthazar Hubmeyer? Oh my goodness, if there ever was a case of the cover band following the headliner act, it is uh, this evening, absolutely for sure. Oh goodness. Well, how do, you, uh, how do you gather a crowd for a lecture series? Well, you institute it uh, the same time you give the theology midterm, and then you offer extra credit for students to show up. That's how you do it. Here we go. 
I want to, uh, I thought that uh, this evening it would be uh, appropriate as we institute this lecture series uh, as the Baltazar Hubmeyer School of Theology and Missions to, uh, to talk a bit about uh, Hubmeyer and his, uh, and his uh, theology specifically. Um, the, uh, there are a couple of theological distinctives that I'm going to focus on as we move through, but I'm going to give a little a bit of history with that um, and deal a little bit with uh, the distinctives that were in his Anabaptist revivals, both in Waldsut and in Moravia. I am going to uh, primarily read my lecture tonight, and you'll notice, uh, you'll say, well, then it doesn't have the personal nature of Dr. Patterson's lecture, and there's a reason for that. Uh, as I read, I'm reading... Uh, uh, lecture that is gathered from the sources, and for Dr. Patterson, it was eyewitness testimony. So as he, as he described those moments, uh, you felt like he was there, and that's because he actually was there. And so uh, this is um, a, um, uh, a set of, uh, kind of I've combined two different uh, focal lectures tonight into this one presentation that I've entitled, According to the Plumb Line of Holy Scripture, Balthazar Hubmeyer and the Theological Distinctives in the Anabaptist Revivals in Waldsut and Moravia. You've heard quite a bit about Hubmeyer. He is indeed um, a pivotal figure uh, for Anabaptists in the 16th century in his, um, uh, as, a, uh, as a major, major theologian of the Anabaptist uh, movement. And uh, as I said to Dr. Patterson uh, during the break, I am not at all surprised that Dr. Canner has named his dog after Balthazar Hubmeyer because he treats all of his theologians like dogs. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And as we, as we begin, I, I am a little nervous. Some, most of you will not understand this. Uh, some of you will, that the most, the, the most pressing issue for me at the moment is the most thing that makes me nervous is um, uh, split infinitives and dangling participles that I missed. Any of this. If you've written for Dr. Patterson, you'll know what I mean. In 2007, Stephen J. Nichols published a concise, popular book on the Reformation of the 16th century entitled The Reformation, How a Monk and a Mallet Changed the World. Nichols begins his introduction to the book with these words. Historians like dates, and one of the dates that historians like best is October 31st, 1517. On that day, one monk with a mallet in hand nailed a document to the church door in Wittenberg. Martin Luther, the mallet-wielding monk, could keep silent no longer. He and his list of 95 theses triggered a reformation that would sweep across his native German lands, across Europe, and eventually across the entire world. The world would never be the same. With due deference to Nichols' scholarship, a sound that reverberated throughout Europe earlier and much louder than Luther's Wittenberg mallet in 1517, was the mechanical thumping of Johann Froben's printing press in Basel in 1516 as it printed Erasmus's Novum Instrumentum Omni, the first published Greek New Testament. The Reformation of the 16th century spread um, throughout the European continent, influenced by Luther in varying degrees. But everywhere it spread, it was influenced primarily by the study of the Bible. As the reformers begin to study the Bible, their reforming ideals begin to materialize. Luther's reclamation of justification by faith alone came as he studied Paul's letter to the Romans. The Reformation in Zurich began to rumble as Zwingli formed humanist sodalities or small reading groups and directed their attention to the New Testament. The Bible became the initial source document for the beginnings of the Reformation. These early periods of Bible reading and study eventually developed into mature realizations of New Testament Christianity, and for some would lead to a full-on Baptist revival, which is perhaps the more appropriate term than Reformation, because those that would become labeled Anabaptists 
did not look to reform the church of the day. Rather, they sought to reclaim for the 16th century the faith and practice of the New Testament churches of the first century. The very first rumblings of that revival began in October of 1523 at the Second Zurich Disputation. The disputation was a public hearing and debate before the city council used to legitimize reforming ideals and to establish a reforming pattern. The first Zurich disputation had taken place earlier in mid-1523, and during that disputation, Zwingli had won a victory for the preaching of the gospel in Zurich and had established a Reformation trajectory for the city and the canton. The second disputation focused on the mass and the proper practice of it. Many sought to abolish the medieval mass completely, and indeed, Zwingli himself saw the necessity. However, he was willing to allow the city council time to come to that conclusion and allow them to set the schedule for the reforming of the mass by their own wisdom. The group of young radicals, including Conrad Grable and Simon Stomp, believed that the word of God was to be obeyed unquestionably. Thus, the mass should be abolished immediately without debate. Zwingli won the day, and the Mass temporarily continued. The radicals, however, continued to read their Bibles in their groups and spread their thoughts on the matter person to person. From the beginning, the Zurich reading groups included lay people throughout the city, and these meetings proved important in continuing the ideas of the radicals. See Arnold Snyder commenting on the phenomenon of lay Bible reading in Zurich, writes this, The importance of the model of grassroots Bible study cannot be overemphasized in describing the origin of the Anabaptist movement. The crack that was developing in 1523 between Zwingli and those of his followers that would become Anabaptists only increased from October on and would grow into a full fracture soon thereafter. Taking part in that second Zurich disputation was the pastor and trained theologian of nearby Waldstadt, Dr. Balthazar Hubmeier. Hubmeier's study of the Bible led to his own conversion, propelled his two primary reforming efforts in Waldstadt and Nicholsburg, and was the source for his theology in all of his writings. A review of Hubmeier's Anabaptist reforms in his theology indicate a theologian and reformer who was above all a disciple of Christ and was driven by a resolute and uncompromising biblicism. Now, Hubmeier's recorded history begins in 1503 with his matriculation at the University of Freiburg. He was born in Freiburg, Germany around 1480, probably in a peasant's home, but little else is known about his early life. At the University of Freiburg, he studied under Johann Eck, Luther's later opponent at Leipzig. Hubmeier, having already taken holy orders at that point, devoted himself to theology under Eck's direction. Hubmeier was a gifted student and while at Freiburg began studies of the biblical languages. Evidence indicates also that he was an effective preacher. Hubmeier received his early degrees at Freiburg and succeeded Eck as rector of the university when Eck moved to the University of Ingolstadt in 1512, uh, 1510. In 1512, Hubmeier followed Eck to Ingolstadt and later in that year was awarded his doctorate in theology. Hubmeier began his professorship in theology at Ingolstadt as well as his pastoral priestly duties in the largest church in the city. Somewhat mysteriously, Hubmeier left Ingolstadt in 1516 to take the position of cathedral preacher in the city of Regensburg. And William Estep suggested that Hubmeier's reputation as an effective preacher had spread, leading to the call. While at Regensburg, Hubmeier's reputation would continue to spread as the city became a popular pilgrimage destination due to the reported miracles taking place at the Shonen Maria to the Beautiful Mary, the chapel which Hubmeier had been instrumental in establishing. At some point, Hubmeier lost his enthusiasm for the pilgrim preaching, perhaps losing his taste for the theatrics associated with the supposed miracle. In seizing the, uh, the occasion of an outbreak of the plague in Regensburg, he accepted the call to the larger of two parishes in the small town on the Rhine, Waldshut. Hubmeier arrived in Waldshut early in 1521, and before his tenure was up, Hubmeier would make the transition from Catholic priest to reformer to Anabaptist. Sometime around 1522, Hubmeier traveled to Basel and was influenced by the Renaissance humanism of the university there. He returned to Waldshut with a renewed commitment to study the scripture 
which he began doing earlier in his days in Valtzit. And he immersed himself then after that return into Paul's epistles. That proved to be the turning point for him. 1522 proved to be the pivotal year, perhaps even the year of his own personal conversion to Christ. Hubmeyer began with intentional fervor to reform the church at Valtzit and found some more uh, support among the people as well as the officials of the city. His participation in the Zurich Disputation, however, drew the negative attention of the Austrian government, which controlled the southern German region at that point. Hubmeyer and Waldsut quickly became an irritation to the Catholic ruler of Austria, Ferdinand I. Attention to Hubmeyer's reforming efforts in Waldsut grew in early spring of 1524, when Hubmeyer's 18 theses concerning the Christian life was published. These theses explained Hubmeyer's early Reformation thought and in some degree established a Reformation plan for the church in Walza. Some of the principles were general Protestant principles. Hubmeyer begins the theses with the first one, that faith alone makes us righteous before God. He states as well, the Mass is not a sacrifice, but a memorial of the death of Christ. He also calls for the Mass to be in the common language of the people and calls for the Bible to be made available in the common language of the people as well. Theological teaching should spring forth from the Bible alone, and the only legitimate priest is the one who preaches the Word of God. These he held in common with his colleagues of the Swiss Reformation. Some of the reforming principles of the theses, however, indicate a development beyond Zwingli and the other reformers. Some of Hubmeyer's early statements indicate an early hint of Baptist distinctive. <laughs> In the eighth thesis, he writes, since every Christian believes and is baptized for himself, everyone should see and judge by Scripture, whether he is being rightly fed and watered by his shepherd. Two aspects of this particular thesis are interesting. One is the note of everyone being baptized for himself. And the second is the call for pastoral accountability by the Christian congregation. Both of these would certainly become Anabaptist principles that are not in the Protestant distinctives. In addition, Hubmeyer uses the term fellows to refer to the membership of the congregation. As Pipkin and Yoder comment, the term indicates a concept of membership involving rights and obligations, different from the picture of the parish folk as a public or audience. In the same thesis, he calls for the congregational obligation to support their own pastor. These ideas run counter to the state church concept of the magisterial Protestant reformers and hint at elements that are only proper to a free church, a church that is autonomous from the government or higher ecclesiastical authority and one that consists only of believers. Hubmeyer's primary reviving principle was in full force, namely the restitution of the churches following only the faith and practice of the New Testament churches. His study of Scripture was leading him to venture beyond the writings of the other reformers. A year after the publication of the 18 Theses, Hubmeyer would move irreparably beyond the Swiss Reformation. Zurich city officials attempted to eradicate the Anabaptist movement that had come to full fruition on January the 21st, 1525, with the first 16th century believers' baptisms. And many of the Anabaptists were expelled from the city. One of the Anabaptists expelled was Wilhelm Reublin. Upon fleeing Zurich, Reublin made his way to Waldsut in January. Reublin, Reublin preached the Anabaptist calls in Waldsut, and some believers were baptized there, but Hubmeyer himself was not. Sometime in February or March, Conrad Grable was in Waldsut and attempted to convince Hubmeyer to accept baptism. Yet Hubmeyer did not submit to baptism at that time. However, in April, Wilhelm Reublin returned to Waldsut. And on Easter Saturday, no, I didn't say that wrong. That's the day before Easter Sunday. On Easter Saturday, Hubmeyer and a number of others were then baptized by Reublin. The beginning of the Anabaptist revival in Waldsut began to grow exponentially, with Hubmeyer baptizing about 300 people that week. In reforming the church in Waldsut, Hubmeyer followed the scriptural principle that the Christian church should follow the commands of Christ. The church was to practice as a New Testament established, and if Christ had not commanded it, the church should avoid it. The primary areas of New Testament restoration 
in the vaults of the church were baptism and the Lord's Supper. Hubmeyer had questioned infant baptism for some time, but instituting believer's baptism was a more radical step. Believer's baptism is a complete rejection of infant baptism as a true baptism. So the institution of believer's baptism necessarily established a new separated church. Perhaps it was the acceptance of believer's baptism that finally split the reform factions in southern Germany and Switzerland. In the early months of 1525, there is indication that the reformers in Basel, Schaffhausen, and even Strasbourg had some sympathy with Hubmeier in questioning infant baptism. However, by the middle of 1525, after Hubmeier's baptism, the others seem to have established themselves firmly on the side of Zwingli. After April, the church in Waldset was firmly in revival as an Anabaptist congregation. That revival changed the observance of the Mass as well. The Swiss reformers with whom Hubmeier was closely associated had rejected the Mass as a sacrifice at least by 1523. But in Zurich, for instance, it was not abolished until April 1525, the same month Hubmeier was baptized. In Waldshut, Hubmeier had begun the observance of the Mass in German instead of Latin in 1524. By March 1525, the preaching of the Bible had taken the central emphasis of that service. After the Anabaptist revival began full force in April, a new celebration of the Lord's Supper, following the biblical pattern, fully eliminated the Mass completely. With the institution of the Lord's Supper, Waldshut was now fully an Anabaptist congregation, withholding the fellowship of the Lord's Supper from anyone not baptized as a believer. The Anabaptist congregation continued there until December of that same year. By December, the political situation had become desperate for Waldshut. Under political pressure, Hubmeier fled the town on December 5th, 1525. By Christmas, the Catholic Mass had been reestablished in Waldshut. Hubmeier was now a fugitive, fleeing the authorities who demanded his arrest and punishment. Torsten Bergsten, in his biography of Hubmeier, highlights words that Hubmeier wrote in his dialogue with Zwingli's baptism book just a few weeks from being forced to flee. Hubmeier wrote, For the spirit of man does not become peaceful except through a clear word of God, without which there is neither faith nor peace. From Hubmeier's perspective, there could be no peace, even in the absence of political and religious conflict if one is disobedient to Scripture in establishing that peace. Hubmeier soon began to experience the full force of opposition in his flight for the immortal truth of God's Word. Upon fleeing Waldshut, he arrived in Zurich, was soon arrested and questioned. Hubmeier requested and was granted a disputation meeting with the Zurich Reformers. During that meeting, in an unexpected move, Hubmeier recanted his beliefs on baptism. There's quite a bit of debate as to what led to that, if you want to ask me about that later, we could uh, talk about uh, his recantation a bit. However, that seeming victory uh, for the Zurich reformers was short-lived. Hubmeier was scheduled to read his recantation publicly in the Fraumünster, but chose to take the opportunity to change his recantation and offer a defense of believer's baptism instead. Zwingli interrupted. Hubmeier was returned to prison and this time tortured on the rack until the recantation could be reestablished. Hubmeier was required again to recant and then forced to leave the city. He would not return to Switzerland again. After a short stay in Augsburg, Hubmeier arrived in Nicholsburg, Moravia in July 1526. 16th century Moravia has been called a promised land for the Anabaptists. Jason Graffinino notes the level of relig relative religious freedom in Nicholsburg during the early part of the 16th century was unique in Europe. Hubmeier's arrival in Nicholsburg would mark the beginning of the most fruitful and influential period of his ministry. Few records about the Anabaptist revival in Nicholsburg actually survive, but we do know that Hubmeier had almost immediate success there. Hubmeier quickly won the Reformation leaders in Nicholsburg to the Anabaptist cause. Within a few months, he also baptized Leonhard Lichtenstein, the governor of the town. Hubmeier referred to Nicholsburg as the city on the hill shining brightly, and indeed it became that practically. As word spread that Hubmeier had established a free Anabaptist congregation there, Anabaptists from all over came for asylum. 
to be part of the congregation. The Anabaptist calls grew exponentially through the influx of Anabaptists from other places, as well as Anabaptist converts within Nicholsburg. Reports suggest that as few as 2,000 as many as, and as many as 6,000 baptisms took place during that one year that Hubmeyer ministered there, with one estimation being as high even as 12,000. You heard me correctly, one year of ministry, anywhere from two to 12,000 baptisms. The extreme growth of the congregation led Hubmeyer to a significant portion of his writings. He completed his catechism, a work on baptism, a work on the Lord's Supper, and two works on church discipline by early 1527. These writings were intended to give form to the new congregation and to recover the true scriptural practices. As Bergston notes, the scriptures were for Hubmeyer the authority of shaping the life of the church. And Martin Rothkegel states the goal of the Nicholsburg Reformation was nothing less than the restitution of the Christian church according to the word of God. That shaping of the church, according to the Word of God, highlights two foundational Anabaptist theological distinctives that I want to examine a little bit further. Some of the earliest remarks from Hubmeyer that we have are from his comments made at the Second Zurich Disputation in 1523. His comments at that disputation indicate an approach to the sufficiency of Scripture that would continue to, uh, as he grew into Anabaptism. Within those comments, we can see three elements of Hubmeyer's perspective on the sufficiency of Scripture that help explain this Anabaptist distinctive. First, Hubmeyer underscores the Bible as the sole legitimate source and judge for all doctrinal concerns. The record of the disputation records Hubmeyer asserting, for in all divisive questions and controversies, only Scripture canonized and sanctified by God himself should and must be the judge. No one else or heaven and earth, earth must fall. He further notes the error and uh, the abuses of making images in the mass shall be demonstrated only through the plumb line of the bright, clear word of God, thereby being recognized and moderated and what is built thereupon will remain finally and permanently for the word of God is invincible. That terminology of the plumb line of Hurley Scripture occurs elsewhere in his treatise Theses Against Deck. Also in that treatise, he further commands to search in Scripture, not in papal law, not councils, not fathers, not schools, for it is the discourse which Christ spoke which shall judge all things. In one of his most important works on the Christian baptism of believers, he issues the call to let the word of God alone be peacemaker and judge. That perspective is repeated throughout Hubmeyer's writings and becomes the method of his reforming work in both Waldsut and Nicholsburg. In his introduction to On the Christian Baptism, he answers the charge of splintering Christianity and forming Anabaptist congregations. His response, we do not make factions and sects, but act in this manner according to the word of God. His indication is that all of his reforming activity is aimed simply at obedience to Christ in all of Christian practice, and Christ's will is in the Bible. In his introduction to, dial to the dialogue with Zingley's baptism book, Hubmeyer states that he was drawn into the debate, even though he preferred not to be. He relates his reasoning, I would have preferred to remain silent only for the use, rebuilding, and edification of the Christian church according to the word of God. His goal was to revive the New Testament pattern in the 16th century churches because it was God's word that provided the legitimate pattern. The scripture and the scripture alone was sufficient for Christian faith and practice. As noted above, Hubmeyer referred to the Bible as invincible. It was therefore the source for the truth of God. As the words attributed to him, uh, to Hubmeyer read, God's word Stand sure forever. The Bible is the unchanging truth of God that sets in judgment of all else. Hence his motto appearing at the conclusion of his writings, truth is immortal. A second element of the sufficiency of Scripture that is indicated in his early remarks that then reverberate throughout his theological writing is that the Word of God is clear and can be understood. 
in his comments in the second Zurich Disputation, he refers to the clear word of God multiple times. A proper understanding of the Bible was available to any who would believe. Hubmeyer's instruction in his introduction to On the Christian Baptism of Believers is to devote yourselves to the clear word of God. Thus, you will grasp the right basis of truth. This is a reforming principle in all of Anabaptism. The Bible can be properly understood by all who have the Holy Spirit. No special training was necessary. C. Arnold Snyder notes that the Anabaptists came to rely not simply on sola scriptura, Scripture alone, one of the principles of the Reformation, but more fundamentally on the premise that the truths of Scripture were accessible to lay readers and hearers of the Word who had only rudimentary educations. The third and perhaps most significant aspect of the sufficiency of Scripture we find in Hubmeyer's comments is that the Bible itself is powerful and can be believed. In his comments at the Second Zurich Disputation, Hubmeyer declared, For it is impossible that the word of God should be preached and not bring works and fruits in that whereto it was sent from God. Hubmeyer alludes here to an element that he would later explain in some detail, namely that the word of God, as the word of God, is living, powerful, and effective. He writes in his first treatise on the freedom of the will, for the divine word is so powerful, authoritative, and strong in the believers, that the person, though not the godless one, can will and do everything that said word commands him to want and do. Hubmeyer continues to illustrate the point, referring to the lame man by the pool of Bethesda in John 5. Jesus commanded the man to rise, take up his bed, and walk. As soon as the powerful word of Christ was spoken, the lame man had power then, through the word, to walk. Hubmeyer says the man might have chosen to lay there and ignore the word of Christ, which is what he means by the godless one. Instead, however, he freely stood and walked because the power of the word of God gave him the freedom. It is the power of the word that restores human freedom of the will after the fall of mankind. During the Reformation of the 16th century, The question between the relationship of the Word and the Spirit was a prominent question. For reformers such as Zwingli and Calvin, the preached Word of God required a separate internal working of the Spirit to be effective. From that perspective, the Spirit may or may not work when the Word is preached. For Hubmeyer, however, the Word of God is always the powerful word, because they are always the powerful words of the Spirit. In one place, Hubmeyer admonishes his readers not to rob the word of God of its efficacy, its power. He then refers to Genesis 1. Hubmeyer alludes to the lesson that the reader of Scripture learns on the very first page of the Bible, namely, that the word of God is powerful and effective. God said, let there be light, and there was light. The sufficiency of the Bible means that there is no other power necessary in order for the gospel to be believed. The hearer of the word of God can believe and obey because the words of God always carry the power of God. It was this very sufficiency and power of the Word of God upon which the entire faith of discipleship to Christ was built. Two German words were used by the Anabaptists to express the core of discipleship. One was the word nachfolge, which means literally following after. The second is the word gelassenheit, which um, probably the closest translation we can get to is this sense of complete surrender or self-abandonment. The scriptural basis for these ideas can be found in Matthew 16, 24 through 26. In Anabaptist thought, following Christ was found in absolute obedience to the word of Christ. The word of Christ, which was equated with the Bible, was to be obeyed immediately and fully and above all other authority. At this junction, the sufficiency of scripture connects to the second major theological core issue, 
that of the believer's church. In order for the Word of God to take its central place in the life of the church, the congregation must be a congregation of disciples, believers in Christ fully surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. Forming such a congregation was a revolutionary act in the 16th century. Even so, it was key in Anabaptist thought. Perhaps as early as late 1523, those Zurich radicals who would eventually accept believers' baptism in January 1525 presented a request to Zwingli asking to establish a separate congregation of only believers. Zwingli's record of this request indicates that the radicals had no hope that widespread unity around the gospel would ever exist in the Zurich Canton, and believers should be allowed to separate in order to live in unity in their obedience to Scripture. As I suggested above, perhaps it was the initiation of believers' baptism in the Waldsfeld congregation by Hutmeyer that fractured the Swiss South German reforms. Questioning infant baptism, as many of the reformers were doing in the Swiss region, could not be the end of the matter. If baptism is valid at all, and infant baptism is not legitimate baptism, then accepting baptism as a believer is the logical necessary step. But that was revolutionary, socially and religiously, because it immediately formed a separate congregation. Several reformers who had questioned infant baptism were not willing to take that step of obedience to the Bible. Why were the Anabaptists willing to take such a radical step and pay often with their lives? I would like to suggest three major aspects of that theological distinctive of the believer's church that made the separate congregation a core aspect in Anabaptist theology. First, the church is the place where believers voluntarily gather around their common confession of faith. That common confession gathers the church. Hubmeyer interpreted Jesus' words to Peter in Matthew 16 to mean that the confession of faith that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, was the rock upon which the church is built. Faith in that confession gathers the congregation. The true confession can only be made willingly. This voluntary principle was so important for Hubmeyer and the Anabaptists as a whole because one cannot coerce discipleship. The true believer must become the true believer by his own volitional will. According to Hubmeyer, not even God coerces followers. In Freedom of the Will 1, Hubmeyer writes, God wants to have uncoerced, willing, and joyous guests and donors. These he loves. For God does not force anyone except through the sending and the calling of his word. This voluntary principle connects to believers' baptism. Only believers are to be baptized because in baptism, one makes their public confession of faith in Christ, and only those mature enough to decide to follow Christ can make that public confession. In the baptismal pool, the believer makes the confession publicly that he or she has already made inwardly, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Only believers can be in the church because only true believers have made the public confession willingly. The second theological aspect of the believer's church is that the congregation is the place where Scripture is to be properly interpreted and obeyed. In Hubmeyer's Theses Against Act, Hubmeyer outlines the proper method for interpreting the Scripture. Hubmeyer writes, The decision which of two understands it more correctly is conceived in the church by the Word of God and born out of faith. Hubmeyer speaks here of conflicting interpretations of Scripture. Certainly the debate over ecclesiastical issues in the 16th century or any century of Christian history, is often a matter of competing interpretations. Hubmeyer's suggestion is that the congregation has the authority of interpretation. In 16th century Catholicism, it was the Pope who had the right of interpretation. And in Protestantism, often it was settled by scholars in debates before the city council. The Anabaptist congregations were gathered around the Word of God and read it and understood it together. Hubmeyer continues in this treatise to state that the interpreters of the Bible, 
should be God-learned. And then he writes this, Then if they are taught by God, so as to set aside all human motivation, they are sitting with Mary at the feet of the Lord, opening the Bible with a prayerful spirit, searching the scriptures like the noble Thessalonians to see whether the things are so. Like the learned scribes, they are bringing forth new and old, to which they submit themselves without any speculation or disputation. Perhaps our prayer should be that our own congregations could be described with such words. The church was not only the place for the Bible to be heard and understood, but also obeyed. Each congregation must be free to hear, understand, and obey the word of Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit through their own collective conscience. The word of God provides any needed correction. Hubmeyer wrote in On Heretics and Those Who Burn Him, Burn Them, but the wrath of God, uh, but the wrath of Scripture is truly a spiritual flame and a loving zeal which burns only with the Word of God. The congregation must be autonomous and separate in order to fully understand and obey Christ's will. Only a congregation of believers can properly understand the Word of God and be obedient to it. The final theological aspect of the believer's church is that the church is the place where the believers in Christ commit themselves to love and fellowship with one another and hold each other accountable to a life pleasing to Christ. This principle is highlighted in Hubmeyer's writings on the Lord's Supper. In the Lord's Supper, the participants voluntarily uh, partake of the bread and the cup, and in participating, each one commits to the other as he will be willing to die for the other just as Christ had died for them. Hubmeyer writes in his own, a form of the Christ's Supper that each participant should commit in their partaking of the elements to love one another, do good, give counsel, and be helpful to one another, offering up his flesh and blood for the other. The celebration of the supper describes a close fellowship of believers that takes place only within the believing congregation. That congregation is also a disciplined one. The believer making his confession of faith and baptism submits himself to the brotherly discipline of the congregation. Believing brothers and sisters hold each other accountable in their commitment to Christ. Hubmeyer's two treatises on church discipline indicate that the church must protect the integrity of the body of Christ. The true church is composed only of believers and fraternal admonition, Hubmeyer's phrase for discipline in the congregation, protects the believers only church. These two foundational elements described here, the sufficiency of scripture and the believer's church properly describe the pattern of revival that Hubmeyer established in Waldsfoot and his Nicholsburg congregation. They also proper, properly describe core belief in all of Anabaptism in its legitimate forms in the 16th century and the centuries following. Anabaptism from different influences at times held to different peripheral issues, but in all of the cases of legitimate Anabaptist thought, these elements were evident and central. May I suggest that they should remain so for all of our Baptist congregations in this century as well. If we are found to abandon the word of God as the powerful, effective authority for our lives and for our churches, then we have abandoned the only source by which men, women, boys, and girls can believe. Only the powerful words of God, which have been spoken by the Spirit in the Bible, can transform the lives of people. Furthermore, if we fail to protect a believer's only church through the proper preaching of the Bible, through believers' only baptism, through the biblical observance of the Lord's Supper, and through godly church discipline, then we lose the proper means by which we are to know Scripture, we lose the fellowship of love presented in the New Testament, and we lose the true gospel as our churches lose their influence in culture. Thank you. Questions? Are there questions? Yeah. Um, uh, do, are there any other questions? Yes, Dr. Patterson. 
uh, I'd, I have not, and I've, I've read through his works a couple of times, and I don't remember seeing any overt references uh, to that particular, uh, to that particular, to those particular writings. I cannot help, though, um, think that that is exactly the conversation uh, that he is entering uh, that debate. Um, one of the things about the freedom of the will, I have heard people say that the Anabaptists hold to an Erasmian understanding of the free will, but I don't agree with that because um, from Erasmus's perspective, uh, Erasmus understood that after the fall, there was still enough left in humanity in order for them to be able to respond, uh, to apply themselves to, the, to, to receive the, the gospel. Uh, and it was specifically the power within the, the, uh, the individual. Hubmeyer's understanding is that, yes, we are absolutely dead and unknowing and ignorant. From his perspective, that's what we received in the fall, was in ignorance. We lost our ability to know. And it is the Bible that restores the will of man. So only the powerful words of God pulls the, the veil back. Um, and so I think he is entering that debate with that distinctive. And also, as I alluded to, the, the debate between word and spirit was extremely prominent in the, uh, in the Reformation because the, the Reformers were in this position uh, of being told they could not understand the Bible because they were departing from the, the official church interpretation, but then they were dealing with other radicals that were not Anabaptists that were telling them they didn't need the Bible, and so they were trying to, to walk that line and bring those two together. So, for instance, with Calvin, uh, the Spirit binds the Word, and the Word binds the Spirit. Um, and so that idea of Word and Spirit was there, unfortunately, because of the strong views of election, both in Luther and in uh, Calvin, the word of God in of itself was not sufficient. There had to be an internal working of the spirit that would uh, allow you to believe. And Hubmeyer is, uh, Hubmeyer is, um, uh, is uh, disputing that, I think, in his distinctive. The, the Anabaptists could have never been uh, reformed. They could have never been uh, predestinarians because of that idea of volunteerism and discipleship cannot be coerced and from their perspective, election was even coercion by God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, I've defended enough papers with you, Dr. Patterson, that I'm not real sure what you're asking. Uh, <laughs> He, yeah, well, because there is uh, the, it's the, the gospel narrative where Mary and Martha uh, are divided, and Martha says, um, you need to come and uh, tell Mary to help me, and Mary, and Jesus says, Mary's chosen the better because she's sitting at the feet, listening to the words of Christ. Um, and so I think if there is, a, uh, if there is a, 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 an indication there, uh, he is indicating that it is the, that perhaps the, the, um, that the truth of the gospel is found in the words of Christ, not in the ceremony and the workings of Catholicism. Um, so I, did you have a different opinion of that or? Was that it? I'll tell you, nothing about uh, musicals. I have a funny story. I was uh, defending a paper with Dr. Patterson one time, and I uh, uh, quoted someone uh, that uh, was had taught at the University of Heidelberg. And Dr. Patterson said, "Now I see you mentioned to this fellow in your paper. Where did he uh, teach?" And I said, well, "Well, he taught in Heidelberg. I had taken a, enough time with him. I knew to knew that know that information." And Dr. Patterson said, well, good. What uh, was Heidelberg famous for? And I said, their university. And Dr. Patterson said, that's correct. What famous musical was written about the University of Heidelberg? And I said, 
I have no idea. You don't know the student prince? There were always those. So every time he asks you a question, you get extremely nervous. JT, you had a question, sir? That, that criticism, okay, so let me see if I can put these thoughts in, in an order so that they're, that I can understand um, what I'm thinking. The, so specifically the notion of the individual interpretation of Scripture was not as much of an, was not as big of an issue in the 16th century as it became later in, for instance, the 20th century in our own Baptist um, uh, context. Um, there were, though, um, a number of those that would be classified as spiritualists or enthusiasts in the 16th century that were not Anabaptists. Unfortunately, in Anabaptist history, sometimes those guys get loop, grouped in, and so the whole movement is put together. Uh, so there were those that, uh, that, and that was, I think, one of the issues with Luther, the radicals that he had was very familiar with were absolutely not Anabaptists, um, like Karl Stadt and the Zwickau prophets and, and uh, Munzer and others. Um, those guys rejected, they, were, they rejected an ecclesiology oftentimes as a whole, so that they rejected the sacraments, they rejected the mass, they rejected infant baptism, but they were not willing to replace it. There was a group that weren't willing to replace it with anything. The Anabaptists were not anti-ecclesiastical. They weren't anti-ecclesiology or anti-church. Um, the, so they were dealing with that. And certainly Hubmeier, uh, his emphasis on the written word of God. What is the word of God to Hubmeier? It is that that we find between the covers in Genesis through Revelation. That is the Bible, the written word. That is the word of God. And so he was emphatic that we hold to that. So he does address uh, and emphasize that to kind of debate that spiritual notion. The other idea about uh, the spiritualist or enthusiast notion is what I'm uh, speaking of. The other notion about just an individual interpretation of Scripture that doesn't need any boundaries on it at all, that just me and my Bible, and I can certainly interpret and understand. Now, there was emphasis on the clarity of the Word of God. Um, many of the Reformers, Luther, Zwingli, and Zwingli wrote a treatise on the clarity and certainty of the Word of God. Uh, Hubmeier talked about that, the perspicuity of Scripture, the clarity of Scripture. That was a sense in which we could understand it and read it, that it was meant for the common person. Even Erasmus was very much an advocate. Um, even as a Catholic, he was very much an advocate of the, of the Bible and the common language of the people, which was something the church completely, the, the Catholic church, completely uh, fought against and, and uh, resisted. But um, still they understood that there was a proper and improper interpretation of the Bible. Not just every interpretation would work. So that's what I mentioned with the Anabaptist distinctive. For the Catholics, who had the right interpretation? The Pope. It was part of what Jesus gave to Peter in the keys um, uh, in, uh, in uh, Matthew. Uh, for the Protestant reformers, it was often the scholars, the learned scholars, and even would allow the city councils and the government to make decision and to sit on judgment of the meaning, of the correct meaning and understanding of the Word of God. For the Anabaptists, to, other, to understand the Word of God, you must be a believer. You must have the Spirit of God uh, residing within you, and you must um, uh, believe in order to come to a correct understanding. You had to come to it with the thought that what I know this to mean, I believe and accept. And so that was that corrective was done within the congregation because members of the congregation might come up to with two different interpretations of scripture. That is really the sum, that is what uh, 
uh, the writing theses against Eck is about. For all practical purposes, it is Hubmeyer's theological method uh, in that particular writing. And he uh, looks at the that the uh, scriptural interpretation within the congregation, that was the way that the Anabaptists uh, did it. That was the believer's uh, church method, as you see in, in others. For instance, uh, uh, I think that uh, you've been required to read um, uh, Malcolm Yarnell's book on the formation of Christian doctrine, and he suggests the same thing in reference to Marpac, that that the, that, that hermeneutic, that Baptist uh, method was reading the Bible under the guidance of the Spirit as disciples of Christ in the congregation. Now, in our Baptist history in the 20th century, um, unfortunately, uh, there were those that took the idea of the priesthood of the believer to an extreme, unbiblical um, uh, way that would said, well, you know, you can't tell me what's right and what's wrong about the Bible or what to believe or not believe. I can understand it just like you can. And that is a uh, misunderstanding, which is why uh, Anabaptists, uh, while there was an individual immediacy, spiritual immediacy between them and Christ, uh, the autonomy was the idea of the congregation. The congregation was the autonomous body that was made up voluntarily of voluntary believers who submitted themselves to that congregation. And the, uh, the congregation was autonomous. They had, the government had no business in the church, and an outside ecclesiastical authority had no business in the church. It was the congregation that uh, was the autonomous body that read the scripture together. Does, does that answer your question at all? Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> You've already got my grade, Aaron. You... Okay. Okay, um, and uh, so if I would have to, if I were to tell you the two things that I see going on in culture and in our churches now that uh, we need to look at Hubmeyer and the Anabaptists and find a corrective, it is uh, two things that I mentioned uh, within those distinctives that I mentioned tonight. The idea of the sufficiency of Scripture in the believer's church. The sufficiency of Scripture is absolutely an essential element. And the one thing that I think that every, every one of us as believers in Christ, as uh, members of congregations need to understand is that notion that the Word of God itself is powerful. We must not leave the authority of the Word of God. Unfortunately, some of you know where I'm going with this, unfortunately in our area, close by, there is a very popular pastor that continues to insist that we need to find other leverages of authority instead of the Bible uh, in order to reach this culture who does not believe currently that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, his argumentation sounds good. We're in a culture that, the Bible, that they just do not believe the Bible is the Word of God. That is correct. We are in a culture where they do not believe the Bible is the Word of God. The difference is, we do believe the Bible is the Word of God, and if the Bible is the Word of God, it is always the Word of God, and it is powerful and effective whether anybody believes it to be the Word of God or not. And the proclamation of the Word of God is what will change the hearts of men and women and boys and girls, and there is no other words given by which people will be able to get saved. If you want people to believe, you give them the words of the Spirit and you send them home to wrestle with the words of the Spirit. As they lay their heads down on their pillow at night, they hear the words of God, not my words, rattling around in their head. That will transform their lives. That's one thing that we need to take from him, the power and the effectiveness, the sufficiency of the Bible. The other is the idea of the congregation. There is a move afoot by which the Bible is being delocalized in the congregation. 
The congregation is the ones that needs to hear. Each individual congregation needs to gather around the Scripture, and they need to hear it preached and proclaimed there in their midst. And they need to understand it and follow it and obey it under their collective conscience. That uh, that idea of the individual autonomous congregation unattached from any structure that delocalizes the Bible is another essential element, I think, that we need to understand uh, from Hobmeyer. So thank you for the opportunity to preach, Aaron. Appreciate that. We're after eight, so good? Okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, we'll gather again tomorrow at 6. I know some of you have uh, some uh, church engagement. Uh, my suggestion to you is bring your whole congregation here. And uh, let's continue to hear Dr. Patterson's eyewitness testimony of uh, the Anabaptist. Uh, but then we'll also uh, hear from... Uh, uh, Dr. Graffanino about Leona Schemer, and uh, assuming if you're doing Schemer, you're doing suffering. Uh, and then I'm going to follow in the footsteps of my uh, progenitor, uh, Girolamo Savanarola, and uh, talk about uh, eschatology in uh, non militant Anabaptists. And so I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. If you can't make it tomorrow, we'll be here on Thursday again uh, uh, from 6 to 8. Again, thank you again. You have a good night. Be safe.